Release the hound. <laughs> This is the Hounds of Diana, live on 24-7 World Radio. I'm your host, Harrison Katz. Back again. Welcome, everyone. Tonight's scriptural reading, I will be reading from the book of Daniel in chapter 5, starting in verse 4 through 9. Now, of course, this is after uh, the Babylonians sacked the temple, and they're having a good old feast. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. And in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was the king greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. And going down to verses 26 through 28 to read what was written on the wall, which of course was, was interpreted to Bel, uh, Belshazzar by the prophet Daniel. And this is what the prophet told him. This is the interpretation of the thing. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And we're going to stop right there. And of course, that very interpretation that he gave the king later that night, the king dies and Babylon falls. The writing is on the wall, everybody. It's just sitting there, waiting for all who have the eyes to see. Over the last, I went back and looked, it was the last seven shows I have spent trying to methodically and historically chronicle the phenomena of both UFOs and extraterrestrials. Seeking to warn you about the proverbial writing on the wall. And I think for the most part, I have outlined sufficient evidence that the Jesuit-controlled papacy is behind the deception of flying saucers and extraterrestrials. But I am no prophet or seer. There, there was no interpretation needed to decipher that truth. It was only through prayer, seeking the Lord, and Him answering that I was able to connect the dots that I, that I came across through my research. But over the last seven shows, there was certain information that I avoided, particularly the role of the Jesuits in literature. Now, when I say literature, I do mean books, but of what genre, you may ask? Well, none other than science fiction. Now, I know that there are hundreds, if not thousands of books that have been written about the Society of Jesus. But yet only a very 
small percentage of these books are nonfiction. So there are what I would say two categories of these nonfiction books that mention the Jesuits or feature a Jesuit priest as a character or as some kind of trope of a religious scientist. So the, the first category out of the two would be historical fiction. All right, and this is widely known and and is talked about, and I'm going to go over some examples of this as well. And the second, other than historical fiction, would be science fiction. So in order to better illustrate this whole concept, I'm going to begin tonight by reading from a website called TV Tropes. Dot org TV tropes and this is under the category on this website called evil Jesuit as a literary trope so reading from this website <clears throat> the Society of Jesus also known by their shorthand name the Jesuits are a Christian specifically Roman Catholic religious order known for their military character, their commitment to broaden Renaissance education, or I would just say education in general, and their, quote, missionary endeavors. Among their religious opponents, chiefly the early Protestants, they accrued a reputation for, listen to this, finding clever arguments to excuse any kind of behavior. That's so true. Common plots have such characters throw off their habit to assume the appearance of laity, sometimes be becoming military leaders or advisors. The historical basis for the society's negative archetypes come largely from their work during the Counter-Reformation. For many centuries, the Roman, Catholics, the Roman Catholic Church relied extensively on secular authorities especially the Holy Roman Emperor, later the King of France, to combat heresy by providing a civil basis for investigating unorthodox beliefs and or practices, and if need be, administering appropriate civil action against the offending party. However, during the height of the Protestant Reformation, various governments in northwestern Europe declared themselves independent of the church spiritual authority as a president for their secular sovereignty establishing either Lutheranism or Calvinism. The two Protestant sects deemed legal options as of the Peace of Augsburg in 1555 as the de facto, if not de jure, state religion. As a result, the church was often without legal recourse to counter what they saw as the epidemic of heresy as the epidemic heresy of Protestantism in these regions, where Catholic and Protestant populations were often engaged, engaged in sectarian violence. In light of these facts, as well as reforms created by the Council of Trent, which stressed using education as the most effective means of combating Protestantism, the Jesuits were often called upon to travel to states in which local Protestant rulers were repressing Roman Catholic populations, or at least disrupting ecclesiastical hierarchy, and engage in what essentially amounted to clandestine missionary work, supporting often secret worship, teaching doctrine, and ingratiating themselves with local ministers in order to encourage them to convert or at least be lenient towards Catholics. Predictably, Protestant governments use their efforts as the occasion to propagandize against the Roman Catholic Church, promoting a view of it as foreign and reactionary. The Jesuits in particular as sinister, subversive infiltrators spreading throughout Christendom, intent upon undermining or overthrowing legitimate local powers and destroying true, that is, Protestant Christianity in favor of the reinstatement of the papal antichrist. This trope 
doesn't just appear in Protestant works, though. The Jesuits also got a bad reputation in Catholic countries, too, and were outright expelled from the Portuguese and Spanish empires, albeit for different reasons. In the 17th century, the Jesuits, who swear an oath of loyalty and obedience to the Pope, in addition to the standard religious vows, became identified with ultramontanism, a doctrine that asserted the absolute supremacy of the Pope in all matters. Although this is largely standard Catholic, standard Catholic doctrine today, there were many movements in Catholicism that opposed that kind of supremacy. Perhaps more significantly, ultramontanism challenged many Catholic rulers' rights to meddle in church affairs, particularly the then standard practice of letting Catholic monarchs choose the church hierarchy with only a nominal papal veto. The Jesuits also gained a reputation for being power-seeking, <clears throat> excuse me, power-seeking and ec economically successful, angering both temporal rulers and higher-ups in the Church of Rome. The fancy logic and scholarship the Jesuits cultivated to beat Protestants in arguments could be used to challenge church orthodoxy, and it is and it often was and still is. And then it goes in and it goes a little bit into some of the Jesuit reductions. Now, also on this website, it also mentions many of the times that the Jesuits are mentioned in historical fiction. So, one of the, one of the examples of this, which I would agree with as being historical fiction, would be the many Chick tracks from Chick publications, <clears throat> which of course featured the ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera. Though that was told in a fictional form, it was portrayed as being actual, actually historical as told by ex-Jesuit Albert Rivera. And I do believe in, in a lot of the historical accuracy in the things that are said in those chick, in those chick tracks. So that's just one example. Um, let's see, literature. Okay, in Jeff Long's, in Jeff Long's The Descent, the leader of the Hadals and the inspiration for Satan posed as a Jesuit priest, though this was later retconned, changing him to a mere disciple of Satan. So, that's one example. The Victorian historical novel Henry Esmond, that's the name of the novel, has a Father Holt who gets involved in the Jacobite rebellion and is at one point shown in Germany commanding Catholic military forces under the name Holtz. And he was a Jesuit priest in the novel Henry Esmond. Neil Stephenson's The Baroque Cycle has the definitely evil Edward de Gex, who eventually disguises himself as a Jansenist, which is a sect which were enemies of the Jesuits, and calls himself by another name. So again, he is a Jesuit who disguises himself as opposition. Cunigan's brother would count in the book Candot, Candid, which was a definite influence on, Hez, on the Hesry Esmond, uh, Henry Esmond novel mentioned above. While a lot of characters change identities in the book, this this character, Kuningans, from The Candidate, he becomes a Jesuit and also uh, also later in the book becomes a military leader. Uh, in Ian Purr's, spelled P-E-A-R-S, novel, an, instant, an instance on the finger post, the narrator of the book, is a Jesuit. Um, the Wandering Jew, which was written by Eugene Sue, has evil Jesuits trying to gain control of the wealth of the title character's last descendants. Um, and, I, and actually, I believe um, Eugene Sue wrote a, another book. I, the name escapes me right now, but it goes into to some of the history of the Jesuit character in The Wandering Jew, which is known as Ronan, and it tells the story of 
of some years when he was a kid and what he was involved in, and the name of that book escapes me. But it was also written by Eugene Sue. Now listen to this. In 20 years after, and the Vicomte de Barguelon, which are the sequels to the Three Musketeers, Aramis becomes a Jesuit priest and later vicar general of the order. So again, one of the three musketeers later on in the trilogy of books becomes a Jesuit priest in those books. Uh, just a couple more here for historical fiction. You have Stendhal's novel, uh, as, uh, which is titled The Red and the Black. And then its main character uh, it shows the main character joining the Jesuit order in his quest for self-advancement. Uh, there's, there's quite a few here. Um, in Flan O'Brien... Uh, she, in her novel, The Hard Life, the protagonist guardian, Mr. Colopy, is friends with a Jesuit priest, Father Kurt Fart. And it looks like there was a bunch of novels written by a Roman Catholic who was a Jesuit himself named Jose Rival. R-A-Z-A-L, and in many of his books he portrays Jesuits, and but he portrays them in a sympathetic light, which is one of the few times that that is done throughout historical fiction. And when we get back from the break, we will continue with this idea of the Jesuit trope throughout science fiction literature. Join me on the other side. Hounds of Diana on 24-7 World Radio. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. I lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und drei Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bude Nico. Ik ben hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke dinsdag om twee uur amerikanische standardtijd het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. This is 24-7 World Radio, your source for the truth. Welcome back, everybody, to the Hounds of Diana here on 24-7 World Radio. So as we just finished before the break, I was just giving you a little overview of a little bit of the history of this Jesuit trope that is there, that is present in literature. I'm not making this up. This is just information that I've come across and that I want to share with you so that I can illustrate a very important point. 
Now, as is the case for examples of Jesuits in historical fiction, the authors of these books, for the most part, deliberately portrayed the prototypical Jesuit counter-reformation agent. For the most part, they were not romanticized, but rather portrayed accurately and in a historical context. Now that's as far as when, how the Jesuits are found in historical fiction. The total opposite treatment is given to the Jesuit priests in the science fiction genre. Numerous short stories and several books of this science fiction subgenre contain either main characters who are named as being Jesuit priests in the story, or there are definite Jesuit traits found in these, quote, religious characters. Science fiction authors have long drawn deep upon philosophy, theology, history, science, and various other disciplines. In the early 20th century, a distinct subgenre of science fiction emerged and continues today. It deals with the Jesuits, exploring and experiencing the clash of reason and revelation within alien cultures and future societies. Classic writers such as Isaac Asimov, James Bleich, Arthur C. Clarke, and Walter Miller Jr., just to name a few, come to mind, followed by contemporary writers such as Mary Dorian Russell and Dan Simmons. Philosophers have long engaged in thought experiments to tease out underpinnings and implications of concepts. Science fiction writers do the same. Characters as Jesuits or modeled on Jesuits are readily found in this literature. Novels and short stories provide a rich context for thought experiments regarding the foundations of metaphysics, morality, science, broader issues in theology, and of course, science fiction staple, social critique, and critical satire. Several scholarly analysis of science fiction in its subgenres exist, but hitherto none has specifically focused on Jesuits and the like. So this is a known topic, but really only amongst science fiction enthusiasts. Now, me myself, personally, I am a avid reader and have been since, uh, since my youth, but I have, was never interested in nonfiction. I was always reading history and, and uh, current, you know, reading up on current events and things like that, and I really just didn't have time for nonfiction. It was only until recently that I started looking into it because I knew that it was one of the media – in which the Jesuits, using their central intelligence agencies, sneak in certain technologies and certain futuristic ideas for predictive programming. And as I began to look more and more deeper into this, I found way more than what I ever expected. So, let's get into some of these examples. Uh, the earliest example of this ex uh, of a an, uh, an earliest example of a Jesuit being mentioned in a science fiction in science fiction literature that I was able to find. Now, again, this is not a definitive list. This is just what my research has turned up. The most early, the earliest uh, incident of this is in a 1926 book titled "And a New Earth." A Romance, and it was written by, I believe it's Charles Ernest Jacombe, last name J-A-C-O-M-B, and A New Earth. And 
in this book, this one's quite interesting, being the earliest. I was not able to find any uh, much background on the author himself, but in it, um, I'll just read it. And again, if you look this book up online, you'll have to read it yourself. It's very hard to find a synopsis of the plot. Uh, religion in and a new earth does not necessarily have negative social impacts. It is the leaders and their self-interested interpretations that have been the problem. Indeed, Jesuits are described as educators and as a result, as members of, quote, a great religious order, which is taken from page 81 of that book and a new earth. And so he has Jesuits as main characters in this book, and I have not read this book, so this is one of the few in which I'm not even quite sure exactly what the plot is about, because I did not have enough time to go through it yet, but that would be something for your future reading, and A New Earth, written in 1926. So that being the earliest, the next couple are in no particular chronological order. The next one is another famous piece of science fiction literature, and the title of this short story – well, actually, it was originally a short story, but then was turned into a novel. It's called A Case of Conscience. A Case of Conscience, written by American writer James Bleich, B-L-I-S-H, and it was first published in 1958. It is the story of a Jesuit who investigates an alien race that has not yet that has no religion yet, but has a perfect, innate sense of morality, a situation with con which conflicts with Catholic teaching. Right. So the basic idea is this Jesuit priest finds this planet in which these reptoid-type creatures are living, and even though they have no, no god, right? And no religion, the in this book are portrayed as having some kind of perfect morality, without God, without Christ, without any of the Catholic dogma. And this is a problem uh, internally for the priest. And he he initially thinks that these these uh, these creatures are uh, were crea creations of Satan. So, very interesting read. A case of conscience by James. Bleich. See, the next book, this book is titled The Streets of Ashkelon. The Streets of Ashkelon. And that's spelled A S H K E L O N. And this is a science fiction short story that was written by American writer Harry Harrison. Would you look at that? And it was also published under the title An Alien Agony. And on this, in the plot of this, you have an atheist who's uh, like a merchant and a trader named John, and he's the only human on an alien planet with all these other alien beings. And all these beings seem to live in a utopia type civilization, and he doesn't really have any contact with them. And then one day, this guy John, he is surprised by the arrival of Father Mark, a missionary who is intent on proselytizing the native aliens. And this – and of course he's a Jesuit priest. And he goes on to teach these aliens the catechism, and he shows them, of course, the, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And I think maybe he even shows them the passion plays, and he teaches them this Catholic dogma. And So you have this priest who's teaching these alien creatures this Catholic dogma. Then you have this atheist character who's trying to – who's supposedly supposed to teach them scientific reason. 
right? And so, so these these aliens not sure in what to believe, they want to use the scientific uh, method to test the Jesuit priest's dogma. Okay, and with accordance to this, they actually crucify the Jesuit and bury him to see if he will rise again the third day. And of course, in the ending of the book, the Jesuit priest rises no more. The next book, and again, I've got many examples, so we're going to probably continue this for the remainder of the show, hopefully. The next book is, well, actually, it's a short story titled The Star. The Star. And it's a science fiction short story written by English writer Arthur C. Clarke, who is a very famous, very famous writer. Um, very famous for many of his predictions that he made as far as technology in many of his books. And I believe this, this little short story won the Hugo Award, whatever that is. Now, the plot of this... And by the way, this this uh, the short story, The Star by Arthur C. Clarke, was adapted to television in the 80s on the, the, uh, the TV series The Twilight Zone. And I believe it was a Christmas special episode, and the name of the episode was the same, The Star. And the plot of it is a group of space explorers from Earth return from return from an expedition to a remote star system where they re discovered the remnants of an advanced civilization that was destroyed when its star went supernova and exploded and the group's chief astrophysicist astrophysicist is a jesuit priest and he's suffering a deep crisis of faith because he's triggered by some undisclosed event during the journey and of course he's He's questioning God in the story, and he's saying, well, God, why would you kill all these people? And, and then he finds out through his calculations, because, of course, he's a Jesuit and an astrophysicist, he finds out that the supernova that he and his crew are witnessing in the story happens to be the same supernova that, of course, in this whole scientific model – this heliocentric Big Bang model that they're using. Of course, light takes so long to travel all the way to our planet. So actually, the supernova that he's witnessing thousands of, and thousands of light years away is, in fact, what the, what the people on Earth saw in Jerusalem around, zero, around, the, uh, uh, around the time that Christ was born and was supposedly seen as the star of Bethlehem in the story. So the whole idea is that this whole civilization of people was destroyed when their star went super well their planets were destroyed when their star went supernova and in order for 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 the heralding of 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 the Jewish Messiah Jesus Christ as it was foretold, as the star would be shown in the east, that all these people had had to die. And so again, you have these moral, morality questions about that many of these science, science fiction writers were, 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 were spot on. Because if you accept aliens and extraterrestrials, and, a, and for that matter, a plurality of worlds as your cosmology, then – and you still call yourself a Christian, then you obviously have not thought out full spectrum all the theological repercussions that come along with you taking that stance. And what you're seeing here in these, in these science fiction short stories are these science fiction writers using Jesuits in the plot of the story to address these questions. The next book, or is this a book or – I believe it was a book or a short story, but it comes from the same author, Arthur C. Clarke, and this is titled A Fall of Moon Dust, which was published in 19 
61. And the premise is simple. In the 21st century, man has, has established several colonies on the moon, the main one being Port Clavius, which of course is after Christo Christopher Clavius, the Jesuit, a cluster of heated domes with an earth atmosphere and a population of 25,000 25, people living on this moon base. And there is, okay, here we go. Things are complicated when the leading expert on lunar geology, who happens to also be a Jesuit priest, Father Vincent Ferraro, SJ, gives dis disastrously misleading information because his instruments detected tremors on the surface and so on and so forth. And of course, you have another Jesuit who is mentioned in this story. And I must say that this Story here, A Fall of Moon Dust by Arthur C. Clarke, written in 1961, is another one of these examples that I have not been able to read fully through. So I'm not fully aware of what the plot of this is, particularly. But again, this would be good reading for you guys who are listening. And all these links to all these stories that I have, the of course, will be found in the description section of my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is Harry Katz. You can find all my my archived episodes of Hounds of Diana that are not available on 247worldradio.com. You can find them on my YouTube. And again, that is Harry Katz. And when we get back from this short break, everybody, we will continue with the last leg of this broadcast. Join me on the other side, the Hounds of Diana. This is 24-7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization, and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 247 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Das ist Bruder Nico. Ich bin Hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke dinsdag om 2 uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en 3 uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is 24-7 World Radio, your source for the truth. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Hounds of Diana on 24-7 World Radio. And I'm your host, Harrison Katz, for this last portion of tonight's broadcast. So, picking up with quite a few more examples of this, this, this Jesuit subgenre in science fiction. It's quite remarkable that this has been here the whole time. And... 
I've yet, I, I've never heard anybody speak on this particular subject. And like I said, I know of no books on this particular subject. So any of you listeners out there, maybe something to look into. All right, picking up. Next, we have famous science fiction writer Ray Bradbury, right? He thought he, was, he wasn't going to get mentioned in this. So Ray Bradbury had an unfinished book, and at the point it was unfinished, it was called, quote, The Fathers. And it eventually became what was known as, quote, The Fire Balloons. Now, it was one of four stories leading off this section of a chronology which involved contact with aboriginal Martian survivors, okay? So in this first part, this, the, the, quote, the fathers, the Jesuit father, Peregrine, and a companion search for God among the Martian hills and find a benign life-saving force which defies analysis and torments the searchers with hopes that God might once again walk with man. Now, that description is so packed with subliminals, and this story is just so, I could probably do a whole broadcast just on this book alone, but we have to move on. The next short story comes from the science fiction, science fiction American writer Isaac Asimov. And this short story was first published in 1966, and it is titled The Key. The Key. And in this short story, somewhere on the moon is hidden an extraterrestrial artifact. And you have two explorers who are looking for it. And I won't... well, I'm gonna I'm, uh, spoilers ahead. I'm gonna spoil it for you, because it's very interesting in this. Because the whole thing is based around this 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 uh the one of the characters who likes a play on who likes to play with words and use puns, and so he leaves a big clue, and which is in the title of the story, the key, and so it was the greatest pun linking the words clue and key. And because the word clue sounds familiar to claw, spelt C-L-A-U, which is the Latinized form of clavius, okay, which is in the book, they talk about the quote-unquote lunar crater that is named after the Jesuit priest Christopher Clavius, who is given who was given the task by his Jesuit masters and the Pope to restructure the Julian calendar and make it into what we have today as the Gregorian calendar. That was headed by Christopher Clavius. And so he is mentioned as being the key in this book. The key to the whole mystery is found in understanding the pun between this idea uh, stemming from Christor, Christopher Clavius's uh, German pronouncement of his name. Let's see. Um, Paul Anderson's The High Crusade, which was published in 1960, uniquely describes medieval knights who overcome invading aliens master their technology, and establish a galactic empire based on Christianity, which attracts many alien believers. In John Morrissey's uh, 1983, The Mansions of Space, future Catholics travel from world to world seeking converts, and they have also transported the Shroud of Turin to another planet for safekeeping. Oh, here's an interesting one. And Robert Silverberg's two books, his 1971 
quote, good news from the Vatican. And also in another uh, author named Simac, a 1981 book called Project Pope, they envision a future Catholic church headed by a robot pope. <laughs> oh, let's see, we got more here. Uh, here's a here's a little one one that's not not from the 1950s and 60s. This was a novel that was published in 1996, and it is titled The Sparrow. The Sparrow, and it is the first novel by author Mary Doria Russell. Now again, it was written in 1996. Here's the plot. In the year 2019, the SETI program at Arecibo Observatory discovers radio broadcasts of music from the vicinity of Alpha Centauri. The first expedition to the planet, which in the book is called Rakat, the world that is sending the music the expedition is organized by guess who <laughs> the society of jesus the jesuits known for their missionary linguistic and scientific activities since the time of its founder In the year 2060, only one of the crew, the Jesuit priest Emilio Sandoz, survives the return to Earth. And he is damaged physically and psychologically. The story is told with parallel plot lines, interspersing the journey of Sandoz, which is the Jesuit, and his friends to the planet Rakat, and Sandoz's ex as experiences upon his return to Earth. Now, again... Just like all the other characters that we've talked about in all these other science fiction books and short stories, this was the author's choice to name these characters and put them in the plot as Jesuit priests. Now, the second novel from that very from the same author, Mary Doria Russell, the follow-up to that book, The Sparrow, is Children of God. And it was published two years later in 1998. And it tells the story of the Jesuit priest, the same one from the first book, Sandoz, his return to Earth. And he gets involved in all the things going on in that. Now, I have not re read either two of these books, but... These books here are just – they're from, from just reading just through the uh, – I mean through the – I mean not the best resource, but just reading on the Wikipedia of this book. It's definitely – if you're into science fiction or you can stand to read it and not fall asleep, which is what I tend to do, I would recommend picking these two up, The Sparrow and Children of God, because these seem to be very heavily talking about the theology – and directly the Jesuits' theology in, in relation to aliens, other worlds, other planets, life, theology, so on and so forth. Now, those were some, again, that was not a complete list, but just some of the direct examples that I could find. Now, there are other examples. This one... It's not as clear-cut, but it's definitely there. It's from the 1965 science fiction novel Dune. And Dune was recently, I think just earlier or maybe late last year, maybe earlier this year. Can't can't remember, but just recent had a remake of the movie that just came out. Now, in this series of Dune, which is originally books, but also in the movies, you have characters which are called Benny Jesuit, a Benny Jesuit, not a Jesuit, but a Jesuit, G-E-S-S-E-R-I-T. Now, you tell me that's not just a subtle play on words. Now, they are all women, 
but they're a priesthood that solely is involved behind the scenes in all the political machinations in this whole created universe. And let me just read their little credo to you. This is quite interesting. And again, this is from the author Frank Herbert in his 1965 novel Dune. And this is from the Creed of the Bene Gesserit. Religion is the emulation of the adult by the child. Religion is the insistment of past beliefs, mythology, which is guesswork, the hidden assumptions of trust in the universe, those pronouncements which men have made in search of personal power, all of it mingled with shreds of enlightenment. And always the ultimate outspoken command is, quote, thou shall not question, end quote. But we question. We break that commandment as a matter of course. The work of which we have set ourselves is the liberating of the imagination, the harnessing of imagination to humankind's deepest sense of creativity. Now, it's also very interesting in this book, the Bene Gesserits are involved in creating false prophecies for a future uh a future leader that is to rule the galaxy or the yeah the galaxy the the to rule the i think there's an empire em, emperor in this story there's an, so therefore an empire and such so again another book that has these tropes and a lot of dune is actually a very interesting read this is one of the few science fiction books that i'm actually considering possibly reading another example of this can be found in another popular, more modern series of science fiction novels known as Hyperion, the Hyperion novels. Now, within these Hyperion novels, again, this is science fiction, so this is, of course, not coming from me. You have a main proponent of this. I mean, it's very, there's, there's, there's much to say about the Jesuits and the Catholics with throughout these whole novels and series and you have this father paul dure he's a jesuit priest of the roman catholic church as well as an archaeologist and this you, there's so there's there's a whole bunch of different jesuits and there's another jesuit in here by the name of lenar hoyt and he this man – no, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's the main one, Father Paul Dure. He gets elected in this novel at to Pope, this Jesuit, and guess what name he takes? Pope Teilhard I. That's right, after none other than Teilhard de Chardin, the famous, infamous Jesuit Pope and evolutionary – Heretic. So again, the whole novella series, science fiction series, Hyperion, is rife with Jesuits all throughout it. Now, I, in, my, in my research and looking for this, I have also come across some other oddities of Jesuits in other forms of science fiction media. Um, this one, not so much science fiction, but more historical fiction in the video game series Assassin's Creed, specifically in Assassin's Creed Memories, which was released in 2015. In this game, there is a character named Alessandro Valignano, which is actually, I believe, is based off of a real historical Jesuit. And he was an Italian Jesuit missionary, and in the game he was a Templar. And he helped to supervise the introduction of Catholicism in the Far East, and more specifically, Japan. All right, so you have this – in this game, the Jesuits are portrayed as being the continuation of the, of the suppressed Templars, which of course is a long talk that I – or a not a long talk, but a talk that I gave and a show that I did 
um, some time ago that you could find that show on my YouTube. I believe it's titled From Templars to Jesuits. But again, you have that, that same theme that I talked about. You have it found right here in Assassin's Creed Memories. Uh, a couple more short ones before it's time to go. Another video game, which the Jesuits... It's not just a video game, but it's a video game. It's a tabletop game. It's known as Warhammer 40,000 or Warhammer 40K. And within this whole universe, which I, I knew nothing about, but within this whole little universe, there is a class of people, a class of military characters, whatever you want to call them, that are known as the Black Templars. And from everything that I can find online about, because there's so much lore involved in this stuff, they are absolutely based off of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order. Um, they're, they have the Templar cross with skulls. So the Jesuits are portrayed in a sympathetic light in these, in these science fiction stories compared to their more critical treatments in historical fiction. But even more interesting, just like all the other numerous examples of sci-fi predicting the future, in this Jesuit subgenre of science fiction, these stories are all predicting exactly what is going on today amongst academics, politicians, and theologians all over the world who are discussing the implications of extraterrestrials and towards God and the Bible and specifically the deity of Christ. So the question is, dear listener, can you see the writing on the wall? I pray that you can. Thank you so much for listening. Until next Monday, God bless. From Feature Story News in Washington,